Is it true you once said that English as a subject at university, um, literature, I mean, was a soft option? That it was just doing what you enjoy doing anyway? That is, reading books.、Um... No, I didn't. In fact, I was arguing, and on occasion still have to argue, the opposite. This goes back to the very beginning of English as an academic subject. There was a demand for it, but the universities themselves didn't take it seriously as an academic discipline. So, to cut a long story short, they would only accept its place in the curriculum if it was made more difficult.、Ah. What I said was that too many people do think of it as a soft option. If you want to find out just how rigorous a course it can be, ask any of my students. If you were to try to read the books on the list for one semester as a leisure activity, you wouldn't get through them, let alone reading them with the proper attention, and then having to come up with a suitable and well thought out critical response. And and it's not just about the set books. There's the whole cultural context to take into account.
It is almost impossible to talk about the history of the novel without starting with a definition of it, which is by no means easy to do. We all know what we ourselves mean by a novel and have our favourite novelists, whether they are from the heyday of Victorian fiction, Dickens, say, or George Eliot, or someone more modern or postmodern. For example, B. S. Johnson. Who is famed for writing a novel that was bought in a box with loose pages that you could read in any order? Again, you might be a fan of crime or detective fiction, which brings the added complication of genre. That is, does the fact that a work of fiction is comedy, tragedy, satire, ghost story, and so on affect our definition? Anyway. As far as the history of the English novel is concerned, we are on fairly solid ground when we date the first novels to the late seventeenth and early eighteenth centuries. The first that is still read as a novel in the way we read novels now is Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, which did have an enormous effect on English prose writing. But for me. It would be Defoe's Robinson Crusoe. Now, people have tried to locate the beginnings even earlier than this to Elizabethan prose writing, and even further back. But I think this is to lose sight of what a novel is and does, and confuses any kind of fiction with the true novel.
The origins of jazz are as richly textured as the music itself. The term jazz really covers many different kinds of music. In the late 19th century, African Americans began performing the folk music known as the blues, whose origins lay in the work songs of slavery days. Within the African American community, the blues evolved into popular commercial music. In 1914, a black orchestra leader named W.C. Handy wrote the St. Louis Blues. Adapting the African American folk idiom to European conventions of orchestration and harmony, Handy produced a hit song. The St. Louis Blues was tremendously influential among black and white musicians, and Handy's style of music became famous under the name of jazz. Early jazz musicians were active in many cities and towns throughout the southern United States. It was New Orleans, with its long tradition of African American music, that was the home of many fathers of jazz. After World War I, the musicians of New Orleans joined the general northward migration of African Americans. The first great national center of jazz was Chicago. From there, the music entered the mainstream and even gave its name to the decade. With its radiant color and plant-like shape, the sea anemone looks more like a flower than an animal. More specifically, the sea anemone is formed quite like the flower for which it is named, with a body like a stem and tentacles like petals in brilliant shades of blue, green, pink, and red. Its diameter varies from about 6 mm in some species to more than 90 cm in the giant varieties of Australia. Like corals, hydras, and jellyfish, sea anemones are colanterates. They can move slowly, but more often they attach the lower part of their cylindrical bodies to rocks, shells, or wharf pilings. The upper end of the sea anemone has a mouth surrounded by tentacles that the animal uses to capture its food. Stinging cells in the tentacles throw out tiny poison threads that paralyze other small sea animals. The tentacles then drag this prey into the sea anemone's mouth. The food is digested in the large inner body cavity. When disturbed a sea anemone retracts its tentacles and shortens its body so that it resembles a lump on a rock. Did anyone happen to catch the American metropolis last night? It was about the growth of cities. I didn't see that, but I did see part of a documentary last week that told about a guy, I think he was a visitor from another country, who wrote a book about the growth of industry and so on, the things we've just studied. I remember he said there was a huge population explosion that turned America into a nation of cities all within a decade. He was talking mostly about Baltimore. Baltimore and then or now? In the 19th century, right after the Civil War. The program you saw was part of the same series as the one I want to tell you about. Last night the topic was New York City. As early as 1880, the federal government wrote a report on how the five separate municipalities of New York actually constituted one vast metropolitan area. It was a progressive way of thinking at the time, and within 20 years, those five municipalities were officially united as a single city by a vote of the people. To this day, however, each borough maintains traces of its original independence. I agree with that. I'm from Brooklyn, and it's definitely different from the rest of New York.
Because of their protected status, a lot of bears have lost their fear of people. This may make them appear tame, but they're still potentially very dangerous. Bears are wild animals. One or two bear attacks occur each year in Glacier Park. The majority of attacks occur because people have surprised the bear. What should we do if we surprise a bear? You should try to avoid encounters in the first place by being alert and make noise, talk loud, holler. Bears will usually move out of the way if they hear people approaching. Some people say to carry bells or put bells on your pack. Most bells, even the so-called bear bells, are not loud enough. Calling out or clapping hands at regular intervals are better ways to make your presence known. But isn't it kind of rude to make a lot of noise in the woods? I mean, people go there for peace and quiet. In bear country, noise is good for you. Hiking quietly endangers you, the bear, and other hikers. People sometimes assume they don't have to make noise while hiking on a well-used trail. Some of the most frequently used trails in Glacier Park are surrounded by excellent bear habitat. You can't predict when and where bears might appear along a trail. That's for sure. I remember my surprise when a black bear charged me. It must have been running away from hikers who surprised it on the trail ahead of me. Don't assume a bear's hearing is any better than your own. Some trail conditions make it hard for bears to see, hear, or smell approaching hikers. You should be especially careful near streams, against the wind, or in dense vegetation. Stay with your group, and if possible, avoid hiking early in the morning, late in the day, or after dark, when bears are more likely to be active. Bears spend a lot of time eating, so avoid hiking in areas like berry patches or fields of glacier lilies. How will the bear act if we surprise it? Bears react differently to each situation. They may appear to tolerate you and then attack without warning. The most important advice I can give you is never to approach a bear intentionally. Is that person really glad to see me? Or are they just being polite? Some people struggle to distinguish a fake grin from a truly happy smile. And computers have found this task even more difficult, that is, until researchers develop a program to detect when a smile is genuine. Visual computing researchers at the University of Bradford in the UK started with software for simulating a changing facial expression. This program can examine a video clip of a human head and identify specific details around the eyes, cheeks and mouth. Then the program tracks the details moving relative to each other as the face smiles. Next, the scientists had their program analyzing two sets of video clips. In one, subjects performed posed smiles. There are some 250 million cars in America. 250 million cars in a country with just over 300 million people. And most of those vehicles, of course, are gas-powered. This poses a huge challenge given the limited supplies of oil and the growing urgency of the global warming crisis. But there's good news, according to our guests today, and that is we have the know-how and the technology to build sleek, fast automobiles that don't use gasoline. These vehicles of tomorrow are powered by hydrogen, electricity, biofuels, and digital technology, and they already exist. So what's stopping us from putting them on the roads? Our guest today will help answer that. originates out of a series of debates within criminology about the narrowness of the definition of crime, that essentially, focuses on individual acts of harm. 
things like interpersonal violence, theft, so on and so forth. So the idea of social harm originally was to expand that notion of harm to encompass the harms that organizations and nation-states cause. But latterly the idea of social harm really now transcends criminology so there are a group of writers who think that, and I would include myself there, that actually there's something to social harm that could be very useful in terms of trying to understand the harms that occur within society, to produce an objective and well-rounded analyses of harm. Those of you who've never heard of the term Neo-Latin may be forgiven for thinking it's a new South American dance craze. If you're puzzled when I tell you it has something to do with the language of Romans, take heart. Over the years, many classes who have confessed they are not really sure what it is either. Some have assumed that they are so-called Late Latin, written at the end of the Roman Empire. Others have supposed it must have been something to do with the Middle Ages. Or perhaps it's that Pseudo-Latin, which my five- and seven-year-old boys seem to have gleaned from the Harry Potter books, useful for spells and curses that they zip one another with makeshift paper ash ones. No, in fact, Neo-Latin is more or less the same as the Latin that was written in the ancient world, classic Latin. So what's so new about it? Stanford University. We all get depressed. Bad stuff happens to us. We all get depressed. We feel lousy. We feel withdrawn. We feel sort of a sense of grief and we're not taking much pleasure and we withdraw. And then we get better. We cope. We heal. We deal with things in life. What's the deal with you that you can't do that? And there's this lurking sense given that all of us have periods of being depressed and come out the other end when you look at people who instead go down and stay down there to this crippling extent, there's always this little voice between the lines there of, come on, pull yourself together. We all deal with this sort of thing. I will make the argument throughout here that depression is as real of a biological disorder as is juvenile diabetes. And you don't sit down a diabetic and say, oh, come on, what's with this insulin stuff? Stop bathing with yourself. <laughs> together, you will see this is just as much of a biological Parents and other adults with whom children have close contact have a powerful influence on children's food preferences. Children are very sensitive to the reactions of those around them, and if they see others enjoying a particular food, they will be inclined more favourably towards that food. Thus, if parents want to persuade their children to eat more vegetables, then rather than simply telling them what to eat, it's more effective to demonstrate that they themselves Let's see what's happening on the seabed. OK, so these really remarkable features are known as black smokers. And don't forget, we're now two and a half kilometres down. The light, it's all pitch black. 
What we're seeing is the lights from the submersible. So imagine you're looking at this out from your porthole and it's a port. The European Economic Community was established in 1957, its aim was, in broad terms, to move towards closer political and economic cooperation. Today, the much larger European Union has a far-reaching influence on many aspects of our lives, from the conditions we work under, to the safety standards we must adhere to, and the environment in which we live. In order to achieve the free flow of goods and services, workers and capital between the member countries, they needed to establish mutual policies in areas as diverse as agriculture, transport and working conditions. When they had agreed on these policies, they became law. Now, though, the EU is concerned with a far wider range of issues. When you hear things like human DNA differs from chimp DNA by only a couple percent, you can't help but wonder, how can that be? How can so few changes make such a big difference? Researchers working with fruit bats and mice think they have an answer, and it lies less in the animal's genes than in the short snippets of DNA that control when and where and how vigorously genes are turned on. If you've ever thought that a bat is basically just a rodent with wings, you're not too far from the mark. One of the most obvious differences between bats and mice is their forearms. Mice have these stubby little legs, and bats have these large, leathery wings. But even those differences are not as major as you might imagine. Mice and bats both have a gene called PRX1, which regulates limb development. But the gene is more active in the budding wings of bats. So the researchers took the piece of DNA that controls PRX1 activity from a bat and stuck it into a mouse. The result, pictured in the January 15 issue of Genes and Development, mice that have longer front legs. Okay, they didn't sprout wings, but the study shows that even small changes can have big consequences. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Karen Hopkin. University graduates will work for a year in industries. Make sure you wash your hands before preparing food.
democracy is constantly offering a stable form of governance. Please turn off the light to save energy. The capacity of computers is expanding rapidly every year. You can keep your bags in the back room.